Hola, comadres. Welcome to another episode of Comadre on the Podcast. This is your host, Marcy. We have a special guest with us here today. His name is Rick, and I'm going to let him introduce himself. Who are you? Oh, love it. Love it. Uh, what's up, everybody? And Marcy, how are you doing? Um, <laughs> my name is Rick Wynn Herrera. Uh, I'm an actor. I'm a comedian, writer, uh, a very artistic person, musician, uh, lover, friend, father. Uh, a lot of hats, a lot of titles, but at the end of the day, I'm just a, a human being following my journey and, and, you know, continue on to finding more purpose in my life and conquering goals and dreams and just living and taking one day at a time. I like that. Okay. So um, I always give the comadres a rundown about how I meet my guests. And um, I just wanted to tell you that. I in the DM. Yeah, he did. <laughs> <laughs> So Rick and I connected via DM on social media. Uh, we both have podcasts and um, he has collaborated before with one of my previous guests, which is Jerry Diaz um, from the Men on Pause podcast. So I thought it would be fun to bring him on. Um, we got to know each other a little bit and um, uh, we came up with a topic together. So today's topic is the effects of autism on the family. And one of the reasons why the topic came up is people a lot of time ask me how my family assimilated to my son's diagnosis, mm -hmm. um, how they work with him and all of that. So I wanted to pick Rick's brain about that, uh, about his particular experience. Uh, but before we get into the topic, I just want to get some of the preliminaries out of the way. And um, I want to ask you, what is your profession? Um, well, what I do as my, you know, nine to five job that pays yeah. bills and all stuff, I'm a project manager, uh, for electrical company. Well, yeah. So Snyder electric. Um, so it's not like, it's a great job. Um, I got into it due to my brother cause he's big in the electrical field and stuff like that. So straight out of college, he was like, listen, I, I know you got dreams and goals, but you also going to have bills too. So you're going to have to learn how to pay them. Um, and I think this would be a good opportunity for you. And I was like, all right, cool. And I got into it and I'm grateful to him because in this industry, I kept on learning and picking it up and, you know, advancing in my career. So that's awesome. Yeah. Um, so tell the audience a little bit about your podcast. I caught a couple of episodes. I know that you're on there with your wife, yeah. um, but kind of give them like a, a picture of what you guys uh, discuss or the type of podcast that it is. Yeah. So it's called the Wind and Cloud podcast uh, with everyday people, all the celebrities. And we interview a, a lot of a lot of people. First thing first, it came out of frustration. I'm not gonna say that, you know, it was something that uh, it was something yeah, where we wanted to do it, and yeah, I wanted to do it from the beginning. But the frustration came out of it because I would reach out to a lot of podcasts to be a guest, and I would not get an answer. And I just felt like, yo, know, it's either yes or no. You're not gonna hurt my feelings. And I, I don't I, I don't gel with so much with this generation of how they don't answer people back either through text email just answer so i literally said can you curse in this podcast because i yes okay so i <laughs> was like fuck you i'm gonna create my own podcast i'm not gonna wait around and wait for people to you know um answer my emails and i i came correct and i was fan of their podcast i will listen so i said i'm gonna create my own thing and i said well now i'm like well what is this gonna be about because just because i want to do it doesn't mean like <laughs> you know i gotta have something so it took me a little bit of time and I said, you know what? I feel like in society and in life, we're always looking up to people we don't know. We glamorize celebrities. We glamorize um, people on, uh, on social media, but we don't really know them. And I said, well, what about the stories that affected you uh, growing up? Like maybe hearing the story of how your mother came to uh, the United States from another country with one dollar in the pocket. I'm like, that's a story. That person has a story. What about a firefighter? What about, you know, the actor that's still struggling to, you know, find his place in this in this world as a creative artist, but he's not getting the shot? I said, you know what? That's what it's going to be about. It's going to be about the everyday people because they have a story to tell. Everyone has a story to tell. And I want to hear it. And I want to shine a light on it. And through there, I want to get to know them as well. And, you know, and I'm a sucker for deep conversation. So I want to make it deep and I want to make it different. I want to ask questions that 
make you uh, not only laugh, but also going to make you think about your own life. Like, holy damn. So mm-hmm. told my wife about it. And she says, I love it. I would love to produce it. She came on board and the rest was history. We started getting a lot of different types. Of, you know, one episode was just about one of my friends who was in. Uh, 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 he was he, he sold drugs, was in the gangs all his life, but changed his life for what changed his life once he became a father, and that was his motivation. Wow! And ever since that day, I would see him at work, and he would be so proud to talk about fatherhood and his son. So I said, I want you to be in the podcast, and he was like, Why me? I said, Because you're a father, and that is so key and so crucial in his life, and you glow. He says, But my life is not interesting. I said, It is to me, and I want to mm-hmm. be on it. I want you to be on the podcast. So stories like that, I just kept on finding. And, you know, of course, we had celebrities, too, which was another thing. It was like, oh, wow, we got people that's in the industry, you know, and to see how humble they still are. So it's just, it's just this podcast just started flourishing. And it was a gift for us. Here we are with the guests would say, man, I learned so much about myself or I haven't thought about those things. But, you know, thank you for this. And I would say, no, thank you, because we also learned from you and we got reminders and new lessons and stuff like that. So. It was a great, um, we're still going. We just took a break and now we're actually redoing it again. But that's what the Winning Cloud podcast is about. And also learn how to work with my wife. That was one of the first projects that we took on together. I was just going to ask you that. How, how was that experience working with her? You know, it took, and it, it's overall, it's great, but it took some time because you had to realize early on that when we're working together, we're not husband and wife. We, we are running a business. We're running, we're running, um, uh, we're creating something. So, you can't bring, uh, you know, you still got the dishes in there. I said, okay, you can't bring those type of conversations mm-hmm. into, you know, going on the podcast list, guessing, organizing that. So like you couldn't see each other that way. So, and we're both controlling people. So we had to learn when to be in control, when not to, and to learn to trust each other in certain areas and also recognize our weaknesses and strengths. Right. So she handles the scheduling. Um, she wanted me evolve as and in, in, in the scheduling that and I said, you know what? You're great at that. So take control of that. You tell me who are the guests mm-hmm. when we do it and I'll be there and I'll do my research. Like we started finding out things that was uh how we could work stronger together and not learn and learning to not take things personal, right? So this was new for me. I worked with people, but working with my wife sometimes you know, as a couple, you tend to take things differently. Like Marcy, I could tell you something. You won't take it personal because we're friends Mm -hmm. where I could say the same exact thing to my wife and she'd probably take it a whole different way. And I'm like, I said it with the same, with the same tone. So there has been times where Mm -hmm. I would say things because me working by myself, I say, Rick, you got to do this. You got to do that. You got to do that. Did you check on that? That's how I talk into myself. I would do the same thing to her. And she's like, whoa, whoa, whoa. First of all, don't be talking to me like that. I was like, wait, how? I'm not talking to you. I, I, have a, I have a regular tone. It's like, nah, that tone sounds like you trying to be pushy. I was like, but that's how I talk to myself. So I had to be aware of how I say things now. It's not, it's not what you say, it's how you say it, you know, because that's how I, that's how I talk to myself. And I never took that person uh, like offensive or whatever. Mm-hmm. So it's been great. Like it's been learning curves. We bumped head, but now we're like learning we kept, we kept still learning, but we found a, a groove now of like, okay, we know what I like. I know what she likes. I know what I don't like. I know, you know, same back and forth. And we continue on now to create other projects and work with each other. That's so dope. Um, I was listening to the last episode that you guys uh, published before you went on hiatus. And mm. and it was interesting, like um, her take on, on, you know, taking on the role of being a co-host now as opposed to just doing the production piece Mm -hmm. and how you guys acclimated to it, which is really, um, it's really telling on your relationship, the fact that you guys are able to compartmentalize Mm -hmm. and um, still work together. Because I know for a fact that during the pandemic, a lot of people had issues with their relationships and things like that. And the fact that you guys were able to come together and have this, you know, create this, you know, project mm-hmm. and have it flourish in the way that it has is um, really, really dope. Um, Thank you. I think a big part of that, you know, starts from the beginning, right? It starts where how we met each other and how it strictly was friendship, you know, just from the beginning and building that foundation. You know, she didn't want me in the beginning. Like she's in the sense of like, I, I kept on shooting my shot, shooting my shot. And she put me in the... <laughs> brother zone in the friend zone no first of all she put me in the friend zone (laughs) then i graduated to the brother zone then the fucking 
chick put me in a next lifetime zone. So I'm I had to fucking die to meet her again next next black lifetime to see if we can oh. actually be together. So <laughs> yeah, so I, I I went through a whole journey, but whole through that journey we built a foundation of friendship, and then I finally made it through. I came back into this life and made it through. <laughs> oh my god, that's awesome! That's a good story. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> So I did a little research about you. You know, I I, I know Jerry um, through the Ladies Roll Salon Chronicles, and um, you dude. know the the fact that he was on my show as well. Um, but I started looking at the web series that you guys were in together, Dad Ruffy, and um, the thing that I love the most about that series is your vulnerability. Both of you guys, how you discuss different issues. Yes, it is. You know in jest not in jest necessarily yeah. but um you are you know there are jokes and stuff like that but the topics you cover and the things that you go into are very representative of dominican culture mm -hmm. um or latino culture rather so yeah. i, I want to um kind of highlight that as well like uh, can you like talk a little bit about um dad Rafi? yeah uh it's funny because i after a while like i just like people it's called dad Rafi. Cause it's like dads in therapy, right? So it's dad therapy, but also ah. people call it dad dad therapy too. And after a while, I just left it alone. Like you know, I let it be whatever people want it to be, as long as they get the message of it, right? Because um, I can also agree with the meaning of dad therapy too. But the idea came um, during during the during the pandemic. I was working on my uh, third one man show, and I was writing it. I was supposed to perform it, and then um, you know. Of course, the pandemic hit, and I said, like, "Well, I'm gonna keep on working on it. We're writing this one man play, so whenever we could perform again." And then I had I had this idea about fatherhood because I'm still knee deep in it because uh, I was still freshly a father, and I had all these emotions that I was going through too, and and then I will go online. And I see all this fucking support system, which is great for mothers. Like every little thing, it was like. Mm -hmm. it, it, is it is is milk not coming out your titty girl come over here. here's a group for that you know what i'm saying like it was like are you depressed right now girl come on in this group we got a group we're oh gonna help gosh. you with that so i'm like god damn there's so much support for women i was like where is it for the dads and i i will see like maybe one or two page compares to the millions for mothers and i was like and i always been the type of person if i see like a hole in something Instead of me complaining about it, it's like, oh, we need more of that. We need why why they shouldn't sell? How about I be the one to start, you know, making a, a shining a light on that? Mm -hmm. So I said, I'm gonna create a show about fatherhood. That's all I had. And I said, you know, and then little by little I say, well, it's gonna be about not only about fatherhood, about men, right? Because in a lot of things that I do in my comedy and my creations, I, I wanna make you laugh, but I also wanna make you think, and I wanna use my story. So I could connect from it and I can learn from it as well. Now, if I can do that in the process of writing can take me on this journey, then I know it's going to take you on that journey as well, because I'm being genuine and it's coming from a truthful place. Um, so I said, I want to talk about fatherhood issues. Now, fatherhood is just not about having a child. It also uh, it will affect you depending on the situation that you had with your with your father in that relationship and that can carry on to your child that you have now fatherhood is is more than just raising a child it's also raising that little child within you too if you haven't let him grow you know so i said i want to go deep into that and now the next thing is i want latino people of color talking about it you know i don't want i want to also break that norm of like yeah men can be emotional men can be hug, you know, hug each other. They don't have to be gay. You know what I'm saying? It's not gay to share emotion. I want to show that. Now I'm like, I need a location. So one day I took my daughter to the park and I'm just there. And I started noticing that these benches, you know, are empty. And I'm like, yo, I remember growing up, the bench was the spot at the parks. We used to chill, we used to talk, whatever. Like, yeah. no, no one's using a bench anymore. We're always on our phone or we're being consumed by something. I was like, yo, that's it. It's gonna be about two men. They meet at a you know at a, at a children's park on a bench. That's what's gonna start the conversation. Now, Jerry, prior to this, um, he was on my podcast and I got to know him. I always seen him around the the, the community of artists. 
And I always respected what he did. And he was very talented. And, you know, in the industry, you always say, yo, we should work together. You know, it was like, yeah, yeah, yeah. We always said that. And here's a project which I always loved about him because he's funny. But what I adore is his relationship and his vulnerability with his daughter, yes, you know, and him sharing that. And I say, yo, Jerry, man, I got an idea. And I think this is what's going to help us work together. And then I brought it up to him. He loved it. We had many Zoom sessions talking about the project. He would share things with his life. I would share things about my life. I saw a story there. I asked him, can I use certain pieces from his life? And I will bring it to He said, absolutely. And then I started forming this show. And naturally, we started building our relationship live while doing the show, too. Um, so, yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a project that I'm truly proud of. My wife is also a director on it, um, producer on it. That was another project now where... We was learning how to work together there. Mm -hmm. And a, a lot of people helped us out with the funding. Thanks to everybody that did that. But I'm, I'm most proud of what we did together to heal our trauma, to relearn from our trauma. Um, and the reaction that we got from people saying, wow, you guys really got deep, really made me think about my relationship with my father, women and men, and then children too. So it's not about the awards we win in. And that's great. We get acknowledged for a lot of festivals and it's amazing. But what's so touching to me is the feedback that we got from episode to episode, touching a nerve and, and people seeing, seeing like, wow, like I can relate to that. And it's refreshing to see men talk because I didn't think that exists. You know what I'm saying? Uh, so, yeah. One of my favorite parts of the first episode was um, where, you know, the, one of the dads reflects on the fact that his relationship with his father, mm. like, you know, he's, he's acknowledging the fact that he does have a good relationship with his daughter, but, um, he didn't have that relationship with his dad. And he says, like, yeah. I wish, I wish I had a dad like me, yeah, essentially. Mm -hmm. And yeah. that, that really touched me. Cause I was like, wow, that's, that's deep. You know what I'm saying? Mm. Like we talk about women having, mother issues which i've talked about on the show um a bunch of times um but men also have father issues as well as well as mother issues you know mm -hmm. um the mother for me i feel like mother wound is 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 something that is something that i have been working on you know like father issues right. yeah but like mother issues as well and then the thing that the relationship with those like main characters in your life, mother and father, mm -hmm. reflect in all kinds of relationships you have. And it affects things as unrelated as like relationships with your with your um professionally, right? Yeah. Um, the relationships you have with your bosses or people that you work with, anybody. It literally show, shows up anywhere. And if you have trauma, like you were saying, it keeps it. Those are cycles that keep repeating. And, and, you know, doing the work eventually, you know, helps you better your relationships with like everybody else, all yeah. human beings, basically. So I really love the fact that you guys um, took on that that um that project and it's i feel like it's it's actually very wonderful um thank you thank you Let i'm gonna make sure i link it. it yeah i'm gonna make sure i link it in the show notes for everybody so that they can um get a chance to look it up so uh let's talk a little let's change gears a little and um let's talk a little bit about your uh your niece i know you're yeah. an uncle mm -hmm. how many nieces and nephews do you have and um I guess share about that. Yeah, I have uh, about four. Yeah, four or five. I'm losing count because a lot of people had a lot of babies. <laughs> so, um, and the reason why I, I, is that our family, we're just naturally separated. Not because we mm. hate each other. You know what I'm saying? It's just um, we are just, uh, we have love for each other, but we all have individual journeys. So there comes a time where, you know, we'll come in for family gatherings, but that's about it. Or maybe there's a funeral. You know what I'm saying? Um, um, mm -hmm. And then there's certain families, members that click more than others. So they see each other. For me, I felt like, you know, I was once close with a lot of my family members. And then I had to go live my own journey. And then I had to retrack and learn a lot about, you know, life and you know, let go of a lot of things. And then, you know, so then I started seeing them when I was around and stuff like, and just accepted the relationship that we have and stuff like that. And there's nothing wrong with that. So I say that to say, that I have nieces and nephews and I'm closer to some more than others. Um, 
and it's it's just a, a natural uh a thing with that um and so i felt like i am an uncle and but to honestly say you know i think what the closest the the closest that i've been like where i felt like maybe i was carrying that title was when when my niece Cheyenne and my other nephew um Suki because I felt like I was in there like for Cheyenne I was in her life from the beginning and and then you know as she got older she lived other places but with Suki I got him where he was like maybe I was around him maybe he was around like maybe nine and then after when I came from college to live with my brother. He was like a, at that core of 13, 14, 15. So I was, I was in his life at a very like, um, important stage of his life where, you know, that the, the purity, the, the being the rebel, figuring out life, mm-hmm. the kids hanging out with the wrong crowd. So I felt like that's when I fully like wore my uncle title. Cause that's when I was really going through it with him. And then my sister, she has three kids. And I felt like um, I'm an, uh, yeah, biologically, I am an uncle to them. And I do have a, mm-hmm. my, but my connection is not as strong with them as I would like it to be. Not because we hate each other, that she just moved from different place to different place. So I say that because, you know, I just don't want to be like, yeah, I'm an uncle. And then try to make it seem like I'm like this amazing <laughs> uncle that had these amazing relationships. I like to break it down and just be honest. It's like, this is no, I'm an uncle to different people. <laughs> So because they can have their own podcast, it was like he was never there for me. I'm like, you're right, because you was in fucking another place. <laughs> the, so, so you were telling me that one of your one of your nieces yes. was diagnosed with autism. Yes. So, um, one of my, I think, two of my nieces were uh, were labeled that they was on the spectrum uh, for being autistic. Now I don't know the official diagnostics. Here's how it went down in, in the in the, the 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 my my mom and my sister's story. So I know my sister, of course, they told her the situation with her kids, and then they tell my mom. And then since me and my mom, you know, we we talk, but we don't talk like all mm-hmm. the time. She was like, um, she told me one day that this is like, oh, Ricky, you know, uh, Brooke, she's autistica. I'm like. Why? She's like, no, she, she, that all, that all teeth, that all, that all teeth, she's something, something's there. I said, what are you talking about? She said, no, she has something wrong with the, with the brain. I'm like, she's fine to me. She looks like, and like, so my mom didn't really know because she's not from that, from that, uh, from that world either. Cause back in the days, they never lived, ne- never uh-huh. le- labeled anyone, anyone. They just said he's hyper or he has a lot of energy, whatever. So my mom hears the news from, and my sister probably broke it down to her correctly, but my mom likes to hear whatever she wants to hear and then switch it. And she just look, looks at it as like, there's something wrong with the brain. I never did anything to look into it further. Cause in my eyes, I don't want to label my nieces or anyone with anything. Cause to be honest, there's something wrong with everybody's fucking brain. You know, <laughs> we got something, everybody got something. Mm-hmm. And for me, with the time that I connected with my nieces, do you know, uh, I didn't see anything like so crucial to even like maybe treat her different or to see her different. I allowed myself to be in her world. That's a gift because she's teaching me something that maybe I needed to be reminded or teaching me something new. I know with some of my experiences with autistic people that they're very creative you know, we're, we're, you know, there's one of the aspects. Mm-hmm. I'm not a professional. Like I said, mm-hmm. I'm still learning from this too. So when you ask me about would you like to learn, I said, absolutely, because I'm open to learn. So my type of form that I was seeing in my, in my nieces, I never went further to see what was the spectrum, what was this and that. I just said, you know what? I'm just going to allow her to take me to her world and whatever she wants to show me and wants to wants me to see, I will be there. And then she was interested, we, we, the way we would connect sometimes, she likes uh, the guitar. So we would play guitar together and I would have that moment with her. If that's the only moment that I would have with my, my niece, then I allowed it and I accepted it. She also now in the stage of likes to draw. So for one of the Christmas, one of the Christmas, I, you know, I was like, then I'm going to buy a whole bunch of crayons and pencils and paper. Let that be my part to support this avenue being creative. Cause I feel 
mm-hmm. that's an outlet for for her not even just because you know she has she's on the spectrum but everyone has an outlet that they need to explore and to do so this is one of her things uh whether it whether it's, it's more because she needed it because of whatever she's dealing with i just just think this is a way for her to be free and to ex- and to communicate um so yeah so that's a story that mm-hmm. i well, with, with my niece and no two of my nieces and um that they they are uh, they're artistic and to me i just never went i never dealt i never dwell more into it not because i don't want to be they don't want to learn about it i just i feel like growing up you know especially in a latino community you know if you hear the word depression anxiety or something like they automatically want to say there's something wrong with your brain and it's not coming from a, a, a mean place it's just that they're just not educated to no, enough to know more or want to ex- or understand they just they label it as that and all of a sudden it's like almost like the, it's a crip is a cripple then now you're just in that box it's yeah. like oh he's she's cool or he's cool but he has this mm-hmm. and i didn't want to do that with my nieces my nieces is my nieces they're a human being i really like that rick um so <laughs> i, I want to touch on two things that you said so yeah. i love the fact that you tried to like step into her world and um really get to know her instead of just like oh she has autism and mm-hmm. that's it you know um that's very important that um we talk about the, that on the show kind of using people first language so people first language is really just acknowledging the person for who they are mm-hmm. and the diagnosis is secondary which is what you did like mm-hmm. naturally which is amazing um and then another thing i want to kind of i haven't really like gotten in the gotten into this part of the of the diagnosis is you know the perception of the latino community for people with special needs you know mm. um kind of a lot of the time it's either and and i'm going to say this and i'm going to give a disclaimer they say that the yeah. they say like esa gente está hey, está loco tiene un problema yeah. right right uh, they're crazy or they have problems right yes. which is uh inaccurate number one. And number two, it's 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 really dismissive, and it and I feel mm-hmm. like it's, I know it's not coming from a uh, from a place of being mean or or negative, but it's really um, I want to say, como se dice, ignorance, a little yeah, bit of it's ignorance. ignorance. No, it's not a little bit; it's a lot. <laughs> so yeah. you know, I, we were raised at least my grandmother. My grandmother understands Aiden now. You know, she's mm-hmm. grandma was born 1936. Right. Um, in the Dominican Republic, and she saw people with special needs, but it wasn't something that they were like interacting on a daily basis, and she didn't really know anybody personally right. that had special needs. So you know, her interacting with my son, it's um, very different. Like I feel like she was more open to it than a lot of the people in my family, mm-hmm. and um, you know, her learning how he is and 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 me telling and like me teaching her as well yeah. has been um an, an experience in and of itself like mm-hmm. he knows he's so smart it, he doesn't really speak spanish like he understands and he speaks yeah. it to people that he knows that don't speak english mm-hmm. which is funny so he knows my grandmother doesn't speak english so he'll yeah. speak to her in spanish That's he'll be funny. like abuelita quiero un poquito de jugo por favor <laughs> and he's very proper mm-hmm. so um you know I thankfully have had like a very, for the most part, uh, positive experiences with regards to family. You know, I have two brothers that are very supportive and mm-hmm. my family is different. Like, that's another thing. Like, I want to uh, sidebar besides yeah. that. Like, I, uh, that's another thing I want to talk about. Like, my family, like, we're all up in each other's business all the time. Yeah. And... I like growing up, I'm like, okay, everybody's family is like that. And then as I got, as I got older, I realized that and not every Dominican family has this dynamic of like being intrusive into each other's lives and like constantly being around each other, which is, Mm -hmm. which is something that I I got used to. But, um, yeah, no, like my, like, you know, we're, we're pretty close knit and I'm not going to say that's every side of my family because I'm not. I don't necessarily have that relationship with my father's side of the family. I feel like yeah. 
they're a little bit more kind of to themselves. We still love each other, but we give each other our space and, you know, everybody yeah. has their own thing going on as well. Exactly. But definitely, like, I feel like the purpose of the podcast is really to educate people. So, mm -hmm. you know, besides like helping parents and giving them resources, I want to educate the community because I feel like there are a lot of resources, like what you were saying about, you know, for the mothers, right? There's a lot mm -hmm. of resources for mothers and helping them with motherhood. But I feel like for the, the communities of color, there's mm -hmm. no specific groups or mm -hmm. you know support groups or orientation or something that you can look for when your child gets diagnosed or to help educate you if you have somebody mm -hmm. in your family that has a special need i was going to ask you um was it challenging or difficult for you uh with your journey of getting the diagnosis from uh the doctor and then actually because you know with doctors they're going to recommend a lot of things right because they're just going based from a, a, a majority of cases of what this is for, for a lot of kids, right? But then a big part of it, too, I feel, is like you have to get to know your child. So, like, let's say they give you 10 things. Maybe five things will work because you're actually getting to know and understand your child. Um, how was that journey for you, like, receiving information from the world and doctors and then receiving information from your actual son teaching you about himself to you and his world yeah so uh I, when when he first got diagnosed i had to actually fight because um he was talking and then all of a sudden he stopped mm. so he regressed like he had over 25 words and then all of a sudden it was like down to like five or six mm. you know um you know, I had to go to the pediatrician and, to, and basically say like, hey, there's something, something's not right. Mm -hmm. And she's like, no, you should wait. I'm like, wait for what? Like, mm -hmm. that doesn't happen. Once you start talking, you don't stop. So, um, you know, going from that and then, you know, obviously they recommend all these things, right? Yeah. Um, I had to kind of be an advocate and really listen to him and who he is as a person mm -hmm. to figure out what things work for him. For example, like some kids like uh, certain types of therapies. Uh, yeah. I found that he likes animals, right? So mm. I, whatever kind of therapy involves animals, I, I make sure that he's participating in it. So the schools that I picked for him, I made sure they had some kind of um, therapy animal that they would work with. So the school that he was in for elementary school, they did a, a program where they did horseback riding, or, or horseback riding. Yeah. So um, equine therapy. So he would go like once a week and go ride horses, right? Mm. Um, the school he's in now, they bring in a therapy dog every week and he gets to oh, hang out with awesome. the dog, you know, and and that's his thing. Like he, like when he's with animals, he's very intuitive. Um, you know, it's been something like I mean, if there's an animal, he's going to try to be around it. Like, you know, it, it's mm. been something that I've, I've learned not to be scared anymore because he has like, he has like this um, sixth sense, I want to say. It's for like animals. He, it seems like he has a gift and a connection with uh, with with animals, and he really a, does. Um, and that's I said that's dope and that's beautiful because he he's he's gonna be able to teach you something about you know the certain animals that he's around. Not even like a like oh this is a, a Labrador or he was born in nineteen. It's like teaching you something on a deeper level with that with that with that animal that he's with. Yeah, I remember when he was, um, I went on a, I, I, cause I do these things with my friends, like, and, and their children that don't have special needs. I like try to bring him around and like have him interact with children that are not on the spectrum to kind yeah. of have them model like appropriate behavior and socialization skills. And, um, I want to say he was about five years old and we went to the, was it the Central Park Zoo? I, no, it was in the Central Park Zoo. We went to the Bronx Zoo um, mm. with my friend Maria and her two boys. And um, we're sitting there watching the seal show. And he's like, seals have out, have inside ears and mm. and they use their whiskers to find food and like all these facts. And I'm just like, okay. like, where did you learn all of this? And he's like, um, and, and then like, you know, with him, it's like he says these things and then he kind of like, 
he'll say it out loud and then like he'll kind of like be in, back in his world yeah so it's like it's like listening like really listening to him because sometimes mm-hmm. it sounds i don't know if you know what scripting is i don't know i don't know if your niece does that because the thing mm-hmm. is mm-hmm. because autism is a spectrum not all children do the same have Thanks. the same types of behaviors mm-hmm. so um scripting is something that um children engage in to understand the world so they repeat either uh dialogue from shows or movies Mm -hmm. or from books to kind of understand what's going on in the world around them so um he does a lot of um he'll do like tv shows or he'll repeat um dialogue from books Mm -hmm. but the way that he uses it it pertains to the situation so it makes sense the way that he's using it so i i I believe that was like something from a cartoon Mm -hmm. um i think it was like diego you know dora and diego yeah it was like something from like diego um but yeah it's been a journey getting to know him and understanding what works for him and that not everything works. Like, I remember one thing I did research was like, uh, it was like nutrition. They're like, oh, you know, kids with autism shouldn't have gluten and yeah, yeah. whatever. So I started researching it and I'm just like, oh, I don't know, you know? Um, naturally he is kind of gluten free, not really. Cause he has bread like once in a while, but yeah. um, you know, like that doesn't work for everybody. I remember yeah. as a special education teacher, I had a lot of children that I was teaching a, a six to one to one classroom. So that's um, six students, one teacher and one assistant teacher. Okay. So it's a smaller setting. It's not like a typical classroom setting, which is 32 kids max. I remember right. growing up, they used to make fun of those classes. And as I got older, I'm like, man, I wish I had those classes because it's you get more attention, you get more hands on learning. Mm-hmm. And I'm like, instead of being in a, in a, in a freaking hot box with 40 other kids. Mm-hmm. <laughs> it's, it's very different. And um, yeah, so the six to one to one classrooms, like you get you get more concentrated attention and, and those kids really they really thrive in that. But like what I what I would see is that a lot of the parents would adopt these um, new fads or mm-hmm. these like um, because they read it somewhere and they yeah. think it's going to cure the autism. Mm-hmm. And that was another thing that I had issues with. There's a lot of people that sell these dreams to parents like, oh, it's going to cure their child. Mm-hmm. But there's it's not a disease, you know, yeah. there's nothing wrong with your child. There's actually if you start looking at it as a gift, then you can mm-hmm. start able to receive it. Don't get me wrong. It's a challenge, right? Because I hear stories, you know, but everything in life is a challenge. But it's a it's a blessing at the end of the day, because I feel like they are very uh, they're very gifted. They're very gifted and they can teach you so much. And yeah. I wanted to ask you, too, real quick. Did you see the shows on Amazon Prime called As We See It? Um, it's no, about I seen it it's a. I think you should watch it. It's about uh, the show about three autistic uh, adults, and what I love about it is that when you see a lot of shows sometimes talking about um, kids on the spectrum and aut- autism, I-, I feel like that's is it, that that story is always being told from a child level. But you don't see it from a grown level uh, uh, journey and the, and, the, and the parents dealing with it, right? Because I feel like one of your concerns probably as a mother, naturally, you're there for him. You're learning for him. You're taking care of him. He's going to become an adult one day. And then, be, mm-hmm. and then no one's going to beat father time, right? So there's going to be a day, you know that you're no longer going to be here and you're going to have concerns. Is he going to be able to take care of himself the way I've been taking care of him? Is he going to be able to flourish in this society that's already going to label him and be against him? And this show touches on that because it's three autistic adults living in um, in an apartment and they have the, the parents hired uh, a, a caretaker of uh, someone that works with them to make sure they're on the track on track and stuff like that. And there is, the, the parents are still involved in their lives. Um, and I don't want to give it away because I thought it was <laughs> beautiful and, and I cried. I laughed because there's a lot of funny stuff that goes on uh, dealing with, with children. And it's natural. Like one of the, the creators is like, 
I had to stop feeling bad that I was laughing at my son Odoru for when I was learning about him because it's like at the end of the day it is funny and they don't mm-hmm. look at it as like you're laughing at them they laugh with them and and of course he when he was creating it too he said the same thing as like having a son and daughter and when they started getting older I started thinking about my own life and like man I, I, I'm teaching them all these things I wonder if they're going to be able to hold on to this all this information so I say that to say I think you should check it out and you know especially since you're in the journey um, and I think it will relate to you even more. And for me, it touched me in a different level because uh, I guess to educate myself more on, you know, on autism and also different stories and how this did, like you said, um, I think one of the lines that the, the, the creator says, like um, meeting someone with autism is basically trying to say that everyone's have a different version of autism. And that's that, like, you can't say, Oh, I have uh I know someone that's autistic and all of a sudden just saying that to say they're like, Oh, I can relate to it because I was like, no, you know, one person with it. And that's your person. This other person has another journey with that too. You know, um, you may be aware of it, but you don't know the full journey of this person because that person mm-hmm. is different from your, your journey with uh, autism. So I yeah. digress, but I think you should check it out. Cause I, it touches on what we're talking about. And I thought it was beautifully done. And it made me think about my own life and, you know, having a daughter too. And, you know, maybe one day she might be diagnosed with something. Right. And how am I going to take it? How am I going to inform myself? Like, how am I going to move? I know I'm not going to judge her. I'm going to have to bring myself into her world and be informed how, how do you live with this and how you grow with this? That's one thing. Um, the diagnosis for, for girls on the spectrum is a little bit, the incidence is lower, but I feel like, there might be misdiagnoses because um, the markers for boys are a little bit more um, noticeable because boys are mm. supposed to be like more rambunctious and, mm. you know, uh, more outgoing. And if you see a boy that's very like to himself, that's like a big, uh, like a big red flag, you okay. know, but for girls, it's a little bit different. And also um, in my research, when I was like uh, going to school, they also find that girls are diagnosed at a, at a later age as well. Mm. It's not, you know, early on for boys, it's like up to 18 months and on, but for girls, it's like, sometimes it could be up to four years old. Oh damn! So, yeah. So it's, it, that's another thing to look at, but I like a lot of the shows that have come out regarding people on the spectrum. There's a show. I don't know if you've caught it on um, Netflix, atypical, Yes, my wife was talking about it. I never seen it, but my wife was t- when we was watching this show. She mentioned that, and she yeah, it is really good, and it's a, it's a, like the challenges of a boy with autism. Um, he's in high school, and he it, like wants to be independent, but the mom is like hovering, and she's not like letting him be his own person. And then mm. the other one is um, the Good Doctor, which is a very uh, you know interesting show. Uh, there was another one too, um, Love on the Spectrum. Mm. Um, Pavel actually put me onto that one. So Love on the Spectrum talks about people who are on the on the spectrum that are trying to find love, mm. and um, th- their their journeys through dating and things like that. Um, I I love the fact that there's a lot of representation, but definitely there was um there was an article I read that not all autism looks like, you know, atypical or the good doctor, you know, um, there's, there's different levels to it. And, um, I, I've gotten to experience like all kinds of levels. There was, um, students that I had that were like nonverbal and, um, Mm. you know, they had to use uh, a device to communicate, which is, you know, it's a challenge in and of Mm. itself, but you know, a lot of the time before they get, the device, there's some aggression, but mm. I think about it. I wouldn't take it personal. Cause if you think about it, like if you have something that's going on that you want to communicate mm. and you can't because you don't have the language, you know, I, I, it, that is definitely like a frustrating situation mm. to be in, you know, I think what I dislike sometimes from what I see is uh, just from the world is that they, we, we, want to put like limits on them like this is as far that they can go so don't push it and you know certain things that i saw and for me like i love seeing shows like that because 
it shows me um, the capabilities. It shows me different journeys. And also for me, I remember watching a off Broadway play, and what in, and what intrigued me in this story was one of the actresses were had had Down syndrome, and I was like, "Wow, look at this!" Like, you know, maybe at one point in her life, when when she communicated maybe to somebody like, "Oh, I'm going to be an actress," you know, uh-huh. they kind of like judge maybe like no i don't think you like oh yeah that's cute but deep down they probably was like i don't think you're gonna be able to right but here she is like and this the the it, she shared her story on in this play and i i thought it was it was wonderful and what i'm trying to say is that like this even with us right with no diagnosis of anything but we all have something right and I, even with that where we have you know our hands and we can speak and we have all these verbal capabilities that maybe another autistic person may not have, but we still put limits on ourselves where they're not even like we give them a diagnosis, but they don't, they don't see it that way. They're, mm-hmm. they're not judging themselves. You know what I'm saying? They're not pitying themselves because they still have a journey to figure out and they're going through it. It's like, well, you figure me out because I already know who and what I am and I'm still learning about me. And uh, I think that's one thing I don't agree with sometimes when I, when I see something like we try to, limit them of what they can do where they they're, they're smarter than us they they yeah. teach us way more they, uh, their world is totally different mm-hmm. with the bullshit that we was told and grew up on in society where oh. they have none of that they're pure they re- and like they remain pure from the time that they they come out where we was once that right and then we dealing with family mm-hmm. the world and all this other bullshit that they put on top of us they remain free from that no matter how much you try to put that on them yeah aiden's very honest i was talking about that with pavel um in the in the previous episode that just came out this week um yeah he's very honest like he's not if he's not with it he's not with it he is mm-hmm. not awesome. one to be like just <laughs> kind of like going you know along with something just because that's what's expected he's not mm-hmm. that type of person and i feel like he's shown me how to be a little bit more authentic and, 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 you know, to set limits and and not do things that I don't want to do. Um, That's great. You know what I'm saying? Just because somebody's asking me to do it, you know? Mm-hmm. So it's very interesting. Um, another thing he's like really into, he's, he's very musical. He's, mm. he's, he's like a singer. He loves to sing. And it's one of the, one of the things that you see him kind of, he loves to sing and dance, so that's one of his one of, one of the things that he really likes to, you know, uh, show off in school. So like mm-hmm. the other day, he was actually in the in the talent show. He decided that he wanted to do a dance from SpongeBob, mm-hmm. and he practiced and and they recorded him, and he was like so proud of himself for you know nice. doing his own thing. And um, <clears throat> it's really refreshing because a lot of kids. A lot of people, like humans in general, we limit ourselves, right? Yeah. And we put this fear, like, people are not going to like what we do. But it's really, a lot of people don't really, mm-hmm. not that they don't care about what we do. It's just nobody's really think of, thinking about it that way. Like, we're really our own worst enemy when it comes mm-hmm. to that kind of, uh, you know, you, vision. This, I agree with you one million percent. And you're taking me back of this beautiful memory that I had where, you know, as an artist, you know, we sometimes we study ourselves, we study the craft and we study other people that we see on stage. Right. I think the most lessons that I ever received wasn't from actors or shows or even watching my own stuff on stage. I have a spiritual teacher that I go to that helped me with my life. And her name is Guru Enlightenment. And to take responsibility for a lot of things, anger, uh, you know, pain and, you know, pointing, being being the victim and pointing the blame on everybody. She helped me a lot figure, you know, find the answers and find my truth and heal from that. And I say that to say um, she uh, adopted uh, a, a, a boy that uh, has a mental, a mental disability, but she never mm-hmm. raised him that way. She allowed him to you know be with other you know people that quote unquote were didn't have any disabilities right but he went to a school um that he was around 
all kids that had all different types of mental disabilities um, and issues and, and, and challenges that they had. And every year um, they used to do a play, right? Now you had kids there that were ver- verbal. You had kids that were very verbal. You had kids that couldn't stand still. You had every type of child that you want to say that they're different. They was in that school and they was in this play. So she invited, she would invite her students. She said, you guys want to come? You know, also I built a relationship with him. His name is Jonathan. Um, you know, he's an adult now. I met him when he was like 14. Now he's like 22, which is crazy. But anyway, wow. I seen him. I seen him. I went to go see his play. They was doing Grease. And also his other brother, Chris, was in it. Um, so I say that to say that I saw every type of diagnosis whatever challenge whatever disability i saw all that in this play but that didn't stop them to act to be themselves to remember the lines the teacher sharing the journey of how they got them to dance sing i got so teary-eyed because i'm like i was like and here i am because i was also preparing for my own show I said, and here I am probably freaking out about the littlest things in life or freaking about certain things and being worried about my show if I'm going to remember certain things. And these kids just show, just did a whole hour play where they had all these challenges that they was dealing with eternally to remember maybe a word. And I got so teary-eyed. That's like, I want to be like them. I want to be free. I want to be free like them. And I said... Because that's what they showed up there. They was fearless. And even if they fucked up on the line, they was they kept going. And even if, you know, everyone participated in their own way what they could. And I thought it was so inspirational. And it goes back to touching on that, like, we as humans put limits on us. But here they are not putting any limits on themselves. Uh, they may know that maybe they're a little different or maybe they ha- they, they learn differently. But that doesn't stop them to learn. And I left that show like so inspired. And I'm like, mm-hmm. I remember I took a picture of all of them because at the end they, they all got together to say, you know, just smile and cheese. Mm-hmm. And I remember I took a, I took a picture of that and then I, I, I printed it out and I framed it on my job. So I could always, and I wrote believe. And I always will always look at that picture because it, it reminded me of the lessons that I learned that day, you know, to never put challenge in yourself and to keep going. <clears throat> I, I I had the the privilege of working in a school. Um, so I don't know if you know Rick, but there's like a specialized district for kids that need uh, smaller settings, right? Mm-hmm. So children that are have uh, disabilities that need a part a particular um, school, the, and those are uh, those are part of a specialized district here in New York City, and that's mm-hmm. called District 75. Mm-hmm. So as part of District 75. Um, as a special education teacher, I worked at this one school, which I love, and I'm going to shout them out, is P94. Mm-hmm. So P94 is... Um, so was that like in the Lower East Side? Yeah. So that, it's was- called the Spectrum School. Um, and they have different little um, sites all over, like the Lower East Side around that area. And um, they put on this show, it's called the Stars Performance, right? Every year, the kids um, get together, they practice, they learn their lines. They do um, either, like, one of the ones that they did, they did Aladdin. Mm. Another one they did... Maybe um, that's the one that I went to. They did a Grease one. I know they did Grease. And, uh, it it might have <laughs> been. What, how many years ago was this? This had to be, like, three, uh, four years ago? Th- around that yeah, time? so, so yeah. They, so, that school goes from, like, pre-K... Well, not pre-K. From kindergarten... All the way, they have kids up to 21 years old. Mm. They um, put on Aladdin. Another one I saw, they wrote their own play at another site. Um, the ki- And the, the kids are so talented. Mm-hmm. So this school is particularly caters to children that are on the spectrum, but all, like, love arts. Because, mm. you know, not every kid on the spectrum likes art. There's yeah. kids that are, like, into science. They're into math, whatever. Yeah. But this is specifically specifically for children that love art. And um, the way that those kids dedicate themselves to practice mm-hmm. and just execute, you know, the, the play and stage directions. And not everybody's on the stage. There's yeah. kids that have a job, like, 
I saw that. Making the mm-hmm. costumes or, you know, directing people or greeting people, you know, and it's like kind of playing into their strengths and, and what they're really good at. And, you know, at the end, like they, they're so proud of themselves. They actually they actually made a movie. I'm going to get you the name of the movie, yeah, send me that. but they, they made a movie at, about the show. They were able to go to another state and perform at, at a big conference. So it, it's it's just so beautiful. And the fact that, you know, we can take so many lessons from them. Mm-hmm. And I, I want to I wanna kind of end the show saying this. It's they can do everything that we can do. They just do it differently. So mm-hmm. it's I, I read something somewhere that they have all the same wiring. I mean, they have all the same connections as us. Mm-hmm. They're just wired differently, mm-hmm. you know? That's so it, that's something that, that that we you know we can keep in mind and you know being more tolerant and, and more accepting of people is like that's one of the things I keep drilling on the show like you know it's it's important but um Rick I thank you so much for being on the show um, thank you this is very different for me and was great I love it <laughs> I'm glad I'm glad um. As always, I'm going to end the show how I usually do it. Just follow me at Comadre on the Pod on IG and Rick on IG at RH Comedy. Okay. Um, his profile on IG has all the links to the shows that he's been in yep. and, uh, and, and his work. But I'm also going to include that in the show notes. If you have any questions at all, please feel free to send me a Comadre Graham. Email me at comadrando at escthenetwork.com or slide up into my DMs like Rick. <laughs> yeah, it works. It works. <laughs> I mean, you might get left on scene sometimes, but hey, you know, you never know. You never know. All it takes is one DM. <laughs> All right. Thank you for spending time with your comadre and your compadre. Uh, have a good night, everyone. Bye.